بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وخاتم النبيين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا المصطفى أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآله وعلى آله وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وقرآنه الحميد وقوله الحق أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لا تلك آيات الكتاب المبين إنا أنزلناه قرآنا إنا أنزلناه قرآنا عربيا لعلكم تعقلون نحن نقص وعليك أحسن القصص بما أوحينا إليك هذا القرآن نحن نقص وعليك أحسن القصص بما أوحينا إليك هذا القرآن بما نحن نقص عليك أحسن القصص بما أوحينا إليك هذا القرآن وإن كنت من قبله لمن الغافلين صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Inshallah, over the next few days, we'll be taking a look at the tafsir of Surah Yusuf, alayhi salam. Then when we come across special events, like the martyrdom of Amir al-Mu'mineen, salam Allah alayhi, then we will take a few days to dedicate the lectures to Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salam, and then we'll go back to the tafsir of 
سورة يوسف and if Allah gives us the tawfiq and the ability and the life then inshallah we'll continue with it afterwards as well Surah Yusuf is indeed one of the miracles where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows if all humanity, all humanity gathers together, unites together to do something against the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will not succeed. They will not succeed. Surah Yusuf shows if a person dedicates himself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has ikhlas, sincerity, then Allah will support him. Allah will strengthen him. Allah will elevate him. And if on the contrary, a person disobeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, goes against the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This individual, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will expose. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will turn the wheel and bring him or her down. It carries the gems of the faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The taqwa, the piety. How one should constantly remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we, inshallah, will go along and get through this surah. There are so many beautiful lessons that this surah carries. And it's unique. The surah is unique in the sense it is the only surah that carries this whole story of one prophet. From the beginning to the end. For example, we have stories of other prophets, the prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. For example, some of his story is mentioned in surah al-Baqarah. Some of his story is mentioned in Surah Ibrahim, and so on and so forth. Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, some of his story is mentioned in one Surah, another story is mentioned in the other parts of the Surah, and so on and so forth. But Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, his story and his upbringing, his rise from him, he was a young boy until he became the king of Egypt. All this is mentioned in one full story. And there is a reason for that will come to insha'Allah. So it's very unique. It's a story like. Let's start. Next time insha'Allah, brothers, if you can bring a copy with the Quran, of the Quran with you so that you can take a look as we go along insha'Allah. So this way, when you read the Quran, when you see it, it also helps you to remember the verses insha'Allah. And insha'Allah, when you do that, when you remember the verses, it will help you, help you understand the meaning, insha'Allah, as well. So next time, bring a copy of the Qur'an to go along. So let's start. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allah says, Alif, Lam, Ra. Several surahs in the Qur'an start with these alphabets. Surah Al-Baqarah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alif, Lam, Mim. Surah Maryam, Kaf, Ha, Ya, Ayn, Saad. This surah, Alif, Lam, Ra and so on and so forth. And the question is why? What, what, do, what do these letters, what do these alphabets mean? And there are several interpretations. For the sake of time, I will go over only two of them. Because in some other lectures of mine, when I did the tafsir of Surah Luqman, I went over quite a few of them, so I don't want this to be a repetition. But nonetheless, just two of them. One tafsir suggests that these are hidden. The meaning of this, of these letters is hidden. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who knows the tafsir of these letters. That's one interpretation. Another interpretation says, no, many people question the Quran. They came to Rasulullah, for example, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, and they say, what is this Quran? This Quran is not a holy book. We can also come up with a copy of the Quran. We can write a book like the Quran. Allah is saying, these or this Quran is composed of alphabets. Alif, Lam, Ra, Kaf, Ha, Ya, Ayn, Saad, and so on and so forth. These are the tools that make this Quran. Take these tools, and try to come up with a Quran. 
It's like, for example, you go to a painter, somebody who's painted a beautiful masterpiece. And you say, this is not a big deal. No, this doesn't look like a masterpiece. You'll say, okay, here is the brush that I used, and here is the paint that I used. Take it and try to draw something better than this. Good luck. Go. Here are the tools. You go. Come up with something like this. And see if you can do so. Allah is saying, here is the tools. Here are the tools. Take them and try to come up with a copy or something better than this Quran. And indeed, throughout history, no matter how much researchers, individuals, even people who go against Islam, Zanadiqa, try to come up with copies like Quran, they failed. They couldn't. Or tried to find some faults in the Quran, again they failed. It is said at the time of Imam al-Askari alayhi salam, there was, there was a philosopher in Iraq known as Abu Ishaq al-Kindi. This philosopher was very well known of his time. Very well known. This Abu Ishaq al-Kindi sat down one day and he started writing a whole book about the negations in the Quran. For example, one part Allah says one thing, another part Allah says another thing. He started writing a book. One of his students comes one day to visit Imam al-Askari alayhi salam. Imam al-Askari tells the student, he says, none of you students of this teacher, of this kindi, stand up to the teacher and tell him what you're doing is not right. He says, the student replied, he said, well, he is the teacher. How can I, the student, question him? How can I oppose him? I don't know what, how to do so. He said, okay, if I tell you what to do, will you do it? The man said, yes, I will. He said, okay, when you go back, one day after the class, go to him and speak nicely to him, have a conversation with him until he kind of starts feeling comfortable with you. When he starts feeling comfortable with you, tell him, I have a question that has come across my mind that I would like to ask you. He'll tell you, what is it? Tell him, you're writing a book about the contradictions in the Quran. There are contradictions, according to you, in the Quran. Tell him, is it possible, is it possible that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to say in the Quran is not what you understood. Is that possible or not possible? Allah is saying something. Now you understood something. Whatever you understood, is it the same thing that Allah wanted to say or could it could be something else? Is that ha possible or not possible? Imam Askari told the student, because your teacher is a, an understandable, understanding scholar, he will tell you, yes, it is possible. Because he's an understanding scholar. He won't deny that. So when he tells you that it's possible, tell him then, could it not be possible that then you misunderstood what he said? And whatever contradictions that you claim there are, they don't exist. They're not really contradictions. So the student said, okay, I'll do that. The student went back to the teacher one day after class. He sat down with the teacher started having a conversation. The teacher started feeling comfortable with him. And then he told the teacher, I have a question to ask you. Something that's been going through my mind lately. He said, what? He said, is it possible that the one who's saying whatever is written in this Holy Quran could mean something other than what you understood? teacher then looked down for a little while then he looked up he said yes it is possible then the student said well if that is possible then how do you know that the contradictions you are claiming exist in the Quran actually truly exist because you misunderstood him so the kindi then looked down he looked up again he said who taught you this question the student said I thought about it. 
He said, it doesn't come from a man like you. The teacher knows. A teacher knows his students. And he knows this student. He said, no, this question doesn't come from you. Where did you get it from? The student hesitated, but the teacher insisted. He said, okay, well, it comes from Imam al-Askari, alayhi salam. The teacher said, yes. Now that's right. From a man like him, such a question comes. And then he took all that he has written and burnt it into the fire. Because he came to understand. So, people along history have tried to come up with such books. And all of them failed. All of them failed. Whether to come up with contradictions in the Quran or another book in the Quran, no, nobody has succeeded. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, here are the tools. Alif, Lam, Ra. Take them and come up with a copy of the Quran if you can. Good luck. Yeah. So Allah says, Alif, Lam, Ra. Tilka ayatul kitab al mubin Tilka is a pronoun to signify something that is far away. When you say tilka means there, not here. Allah is saying tilka ayatul kitab al mubin There, the signs of this holy book are there. The clear book. It's in reference that the Quran, the holy Quran, its meaning is very, it carries a big meaning. Also, Allah refers to something, same meaning in Surah Al-Baqarah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alif, Lam, Mim, Thalika Al-Kitab. Allah doesn't say Hadha Al-Kitab. Hadha means something nearby. When you point at something in Arabic, you say Hadha. Lamir Al-Ishara. But when you say something that's far, you say Thalika. There, it's far. Allah says Alif, Lam, Mim, Thalika Al-Kitab. Not Hadha Al-Kitab. Here Allah also says, Tilka ayatul kitab al mubin Which means this holy Quran, a person should not just jump into it himself and start reading the Quran and interpreting it himself. This Quran carries a lot of meaning. It must be understood by those whom Allah revealed the Quran upon. Allah says, and doesn't know ta his ta'wil, the ta'wil of this book. Illa Allah and who? Warrasikhuna fil ilm. In another ayah in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, Allah says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, لا يمسه إلا المطهرون Which means no one knows its deeper meaning, its deep, its understanding, its interpretation, but the mutahharun. And who are the mutahharun? Allah tells us, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهِ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمْ وَرِجِسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَهِرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا Allahum salli ala Those Ahlul Bayt are the Mutahharun. Amir al Mu'minin sallallahu alayhi wa says, We are the ones who know the Holy Quran. We know every verse in the Quran. When was it revealed? Why was it revealed? We know what is muhkam and what is mutashabah. There are some ayat in the Quran that are muhkamat, which means they're clear. Allah says, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Ya ayuhal ladina amanu kutiba alaykum al siyam. Fasting has been prescribed upon you. This is a clear sign, you know, that doesn't need much interpretation. It's clear. Allah says, for example, Aqimu Salat, establish Salat. That's also clear. These are ayat which are known as Muhkamat. Muhkam. Allah says, Laysa kamithlihi shay. There is nothing like him. Then there are other ayat which are mutashabahat. Mutashabahat means somebody has to do a little bit of thinking. Somebody has to do some understanding. For example, Allah says, Yadu Allah fawqa aydihim. Allah's hand is on top of their hand. Kullu man alayha faan wa yabqa wajuhu rabbika. Dhul jalali wal ikram. Everyone on it will perish except the face of your Lord. Now, does Allah have a face? Does he have a hand? And that's where some Muslims who started interpreting the Quran according to their own limited understanding, started saying, yes, Allah has a hand, he's got a face, and so on and so forth. And if you refer to Sahih al-Bukhari, you'll find many of these ahadith in Bukhari. If anybody is interested, I can give you references. But because of the time, we don't have time to get into it. That's when people don't understand. They use their own limited understanding. 
when we come across an ayah like this, that Allah has a face, that there is a hand, we have to take it against what? An ayah that is muhkam, an ayah that does not really require much. Which one, which one is that one? Allah says, Laysa kamithlihi shay. There is nothing like him. There's nothing like him. And hence, Allah doesn't really literally have a hand. It's the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's, that's made an analogy, a metaphor of the hands. And so on and so forth. Who understands all this? Ahlul Bayt, salamullahi alayhi. So Allah says, Tilka ayatul kitab al mubin That these verses of this holy book, of this clear book, indeed they are very deep. Deep. This book is not an ordinary book. Tilka ayatul kitab al mubin And then Allah says, Inna anzalnahu Qur'anan arabiyan la'allakum ta'qilun. We have revealed it as an Arabic Qur'an so that maybe you can understand now here is a question inna anzalnahu Qur'anan arabiya we have revealed it down as a Qur'an Qur'an sometimes Allah says inna anzalnahu for example inna anzalnahu fi laylatil qadr Quran had two revelations. One, the whole Quran was revealed at one step, one time. The whole Quran was revealed to the Prophet. And when was that revelation? When did it happen? Inna anzalnahu when? Fi laylatil qadr. Allah says, Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran. Quran was revealed in the month of Ramadan. Laylatil qadr, which means Laylatil qadr, falls in the month of Ramadan. That was when the whole Qur'an was revealed upon the Prophet. Then, the Qur'an was revealed in stages over the 23 years. There, in the 23 years, the Qur'an was broken down into verses, into surahs, and hence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did tafseel of the Qur'an. That's why Kitabun fussilat ayatuhu. Allah says about the book that its verses have been put in perspective, into place. At first, the whole Qur'an came down to the Prophet wasallam, and then over the period of the 23 years, the verses for particular occasions, there were reasons, for example, the Battle of Badr, for example, verses revealed about the Battle of Badr, the Battle of Uhud, verses revealed about the Battle of Uhud, and so on and so forth. So there were occasions that took place, and the Qur'an was revealed over the period of 23 years. This... 23 year period and the reasons for the revelation help us understand the Quran because when we take a look at the reason for the revelation why was this verse revealed then we can understand the Quran better when the Quran is broken into verses and chapters and surahs then we understand it better so Allah says here Inna anzalna, we've revealed it Quranan Arabiya it's in Arabic here is a question why was the Quran revealed in Arabic why the Arabic language one reason could be that the Arabic language is considered to be the most structured language in terms of grammar. The most structured language. If you take a look at a paragraph, unless a person is well versed in the Arabic language, but without the fatha, the dhamma, you know the punctuation marks, a person will not read it accurately, will not read the paragraph accurately. There are rules. Amir al-Mu'mineen, salamullahi alayhi, one day he was walking by and he listened to a man reading the first verse, the second verse of Surah At-Tawbah. The second verse of Surah At-Tawbah reads as follows, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim وَأَذَانٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ إِلَى النَّاسِ يَوْمَ الْحَجِّ الْأَكْبَرِ أَنَّ اللَّهَ بَرِيءٌ مِّنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ وَرَسُولُهُ this was the second verse. Now, the ayah says, Anna Allaha, Anna Allaha, there's a fatha on Allaha, right? Anna Allaha. Bari'un min al mushrikina wa rasuluhu. There's a dhamma on the rasul, okay? Inshallah, you understand that part. This man, when he read it, he said, wa rasulahu, with a fatha as well. He put a fatha when he was reading the Quran because the Quran initially did not have punctuation marks like today. In fact, it did not even have dots because people all of them memorized the quran so they, so they took the shortcut when they wrote the quran 
without dots, without punctuation. Everybody knew it by heart. But then later on when Islam started expanding and non-Arabs started becoming Muslims, they started reading the Quran, then they needed to add the dots, they needed to add the punctuations because the non-Arabs started not reading it accurately. So then this man read it like this, وَرَسُولَهُ which means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is disassociating himself from the mushrikeen and from his messenger as well. When you add a fatha, when you make a fatha. وَرَسُولَهُ means that Allah is disassociating himself from the mushrikeen and from his messenger. But when you make it adhamma the way it is, وَرَسُولُهُ it means Allah and his messenger disassociate themselves from who? The mushrikeen. So you see the significance of the dhamma and the fatha? This is very important. When Amir al-Mu'mineen listened to this man, like reading like this, he called upon one of his companions by the name of Abu al-Aswad al-Du'ali. He said, Ya Abu al-Aswad, I'll give you the bullet points and you establish the rules of Nahu, Qawa'd, of Arabic language. Al-fa'il marfu' wal maf'ul mansub. The subject is always has a dhamma on it, or a waw, yurfa' bil waw aw bil dhamma. Maf'ul is always, for example, has a fatha on it. And so Abu al-Aswad took these bullet points and he established the rules of qawa'id al-Nahu. That's why he is considered to be the father of Nahu, the father of the Arabic grammar. He was taught by Amir al-Mu'mineen, sallallahu alayhi So that is how the significant it is. Arabic is very rich in terms of grammar. There is one man, or in fact two of them, who have written poems, 1,000 lines, about Arabic grammar. Al-Fiyat ibn Malik, they teach it in Hawza. In Hawza they teach this, Al-Fiyat ibn Malik. Where he says, Kalamuna lafzun mufidun kastaqim, wasmun wa fi'lun, thumma harfun al-kalim, wahiduhu kalimatun wal qawlu am, wa kalimatun biha kalamun qad yu'am. بِالْجَرِّ وَالتَّنْوِينِ وَالنِّدَى وَأَلْ وَمُسْنَدٍ لِلْإِسْمِ تَمِيزٌ and so on and so forth. Tamizun hasal. Where he goes over the whole grammar of the Arabic language in 1,000 lines of poetry. Ibn Malik. So Arabic is very rich in terms of grammar. Not only in terms of grammar, it's very rich in terms of the language itself. The lion, lion in Arabic, you know, it has 140 names for a lion. 140 names for a lion. Asad, some of you have heard. Asad means lion. Haidar means lion. You know, we call him Amir Haidar. Haidar means lion. Ghavanfar means lion. Sabu means lion. Osama means lion. And so on and so forth. MashaAllah. Good. Alhamdulillah, you find this funny. You know? So, very rich language. Very rich language when it comes to vocabulary. When it comes, for example, to grammar, it's a rich language. That's why, my brothers and sisters, when you read the Quran, make sure you read it correctly. Make sure the fatha is a fatha, the dhamma is a dhamma, the kasra is a kasra, and so on and so forth. Because I remember one day I was sitting down, there was a Quran session in the month of Ramadan, I still remember, with Ayatollah said, Mutad al Qazwini. Like people read the Quran. And this man was reading the ayah, Inna ma yakshallah. من عباده العلماء and I still remember I heard about people misreading this ayah but this happened in front of me إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءُ this is how it's read this man converted it he said إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءَ which means that Allah is afraid of the scholars the way it should be read إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ with a fatha منصوب مفعول به من عباده العلماء which means the علماء fear Allah علماء fear Allah the scholars fear Allah this man reversed it he put the fatha where it's not supposed to be and the dhamma where it's not supposed to be so it became Allah is afraid so the Sayyid told him what you have just said is considered to be kufr Allah is not afraid of anyone so make sure when you read the Quran you read it correctly accurately because sometimes it could be a big consequence the meaning is all changed Allah says, إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَاهُ قُرْآنًا عَرَبِيًّا لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِنُونَ So that you can understand it. Quran was revealed in Hijaz among Quraysh, the Arabs. So they can understand it. And this will go against what they say that this Quran is non-Arabic. 
Some other verses in the Quran, Allah says, they claim that this Quran is not Arabic. It is indeed Arabic. It's their language. They can understand it. But they cannot come up with something like it. This is not poetry. It's the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah says in, surah, in verse number 3, نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنَ الْقَصَصِ بِمَا أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ وَإِنْ كُنْتَ مَنْ قَبْلِهِ لَمِنَ الْغَافِلِينَ we are narrating to you the best of the stories. نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنَ القصص, The best of the stories. A story is basically a list of event consequences. You know, event start with something and then you continue, continue, and then this event was followed by that event and by that event and so on and so forth. It's following. That's a story. Allah says, we are narrating to you the best of the stories. The stories in the Quran are not about some wizards, are not about, for example, some fairy tale, are not about, for example, some science fiction. No, they're all real. The stories of the Quran are composed of real individuals. Pharaoh was a real person. Musa السلام, was a real person. Ibrahim was a real person, Namrud was a real person, Maryam السلام, so on and so forth. These are the stories of humanities, people before you. So that you can distinguish the, verse, the stories in the Quran, they have a reason, they have an admonishment, a ma'udah. Whenever Allah lists a story in the Quran, He gives some reason for it. He gives the advantage, the benefit from the story. Follow the example of Ibrahim and Musa. Don't follow the example of Namrud and Fir'aun. There have been people before you who lived longer than you. Allah says, why can they see? أَلَمْ تَرَ كَيْفَ فَعَلَ رَبُّكَ بِعَادِ إِرَمَ ذَاتِ الْعِمَادِ أَلَّتِي لَمْ يُخْلَقْ مِثْلُهَا فِي الْبِلَادِ Haven't they seen Ad, for example, the one in which the city that now other city was built like this city? Back in those days, it was a very advanced city. Very advanced. That city, what happened to it? It's destroyed. Where are the people? They're destroyed. Where are they? They're all dead. Khalas. So the human being should wake up when he reads these stories of men just like him, individuals like him, humans like him or her. Then he wakes up. He can relate to them. Allah says, Inna nahnu naqussu alayka ahsan al-qasasi bima awhayna ilayka hadha al-Qur'an wa an kunta min qablihi la min al-ghafilin. Before the Qur'an, without us telling you the stories, you wouldn't have known these stories. You yourself, Ya Rasulullah. We are the ones who are telling you the stories. So it is important to go back into the history to learn from the salihin and to stay away from the talihin, those who are the disobedient ones. That's why it's important for us also to learn from the history of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam. On the 17th day of Ramadan was the battle of Badr. The battle of Badr took place. When you tell some youth, we need to understand the battle of Badr. We need to understand the history of Rasulullah. They tell you why. This is long ago. It's boring. No, it's important. Allah uses stories in the Quran. Why? Well, one thing is to give us admonishments, to make us learn. Second thing, most people, whether young or old, everybody enjoys stories. Everybody. Even if it's a, a grandfather, a grandfather or a grandchild, everyone likes stories. Because they're easy to understand, they're easy to grasp. When you tell people, for example, about the concept of Tawheed, the concept of Nubuwa, that could be heavy duty material. You know, sometimes people just can't follow along or they find it boring. But when you add stories to it, to assert the meaning, then it becomes a joyable, enjoyable experience. So Allah knows this. He puts these stories in the Quran so that we can learn and we can benefit. Hence, we have to learn from the stories also of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the history of Rasulullah. Abu Sufyan was coming with a caravan, it is said, with 40 camels. These 40 camels were the investments of Quraysh. 
Quraysh invested into this caravan. 40 camels, the Prophet said, let us go seize these camels, seize this caravan, so that we can limit Quraysh financially. It will be a financial blow to Quraysh. So they went after the caravan. Abu Sufyan had a spy who was looking at the road. The spy comes back to Abu Sufyan. He says, I saw the Muslims. I see the Muslims are coming this route. And they will seize this caravan. So Abu Sufyan told another man. He told him, go to Quraysh. Run to Quraysh and tell them that the Muslims are going to seize your caravan. And he changed his route. Abu Sufyan changed his route. He went through a different route. This man went to Quraysh. He arrived at Quraysh. Three days before this man arrives, Atika, the daughter of Abdul Muttalib, had a dream. In her dream, she saw that a man is coming to Quraysh saying, Ya ala Ghalib, O people of Ghalib, O family of Ghalib, your caravan is going to be seized. Three days before that incident. And then this man went onto a mountain by the name of Abu Qubais. This mountain is shattered now, it doesn't exist. But there was a mountain by the name of Abu Qubais. And he went on top of that mountain. He threw a rock. And in every house of Quraysh, a piece of that rock went into that house. That was her dream. Atika, the daughter of Abdul Muttalib. She told her dream to her brother, Al Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. Abbas went and told it to Utba ibn Rabi'a. Utba, he said, This is a bad dream. This has a bad meaning. He went and told Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl said, What is this with Bani Hashim? One day, one of their men comes and says he's a prophet. Now their women have become prophets too. They're also telling us, if within three days, that dream of this lady doesn't come true, we're going to write a letter. And all of us will sign it that this house of Bani Hashim composed, is com composed of liars. They're all liars. Some of them declare themselves to be prophets. Others, they say that we saw dreams and so on and so forth. Indeed, on the third day, this man comes and he starts calling again, Ya Allah Ghalib, Ya Allah Ghalib. Rush to your caravan. So the dream came true. Abu Jahl, he said, what is the matter? He told him, well, the Muslims are trying to seize the caravan. So he said, let us prepare an army. They prepare an army and they go. By that time, Abu Sufyan reaches to Mecca safely. He managed to reach safely because he took a different route. So Abu Sufyan and Utba ibn Rabi'a, they said, well, since the caravan has arrived, let us go back. We don't need to fight. Abu Jahl said, no, we have to discipline the Muslims. We have to teach them. Let us go fight. This will teach the Muslims not to mess with us, Quraysh. We have never been beaten. Never. No one dares to stand to us, against us. Let us go teach them a lesson. So finally they agreed. They went into an army of 1,000 men. The story reached Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet told his companions, Quraysh is coming. We went after their caravan. We didn't get the caravan. What do you suggest? What do you say? One man, the first man, we won't mention who he, his name, but you know the first. He got up and he said, well, we went after their caravan. We didn't go to fight with them. So let's not fight. The second man, again, we won't mention his name, but you know who the second man was. The second man got up and he said the same thing. Let us not fight. Let us stay away from this battle. Al-Maqdad, however, got up and said, Ya Rasulullah, we believe in you. If you order us to fight, we will fight. Whatever you say, we will follow you, Ya Rasulullah, and we will support you and we will sacrifice our lives for you. So the Prophet felt happy. He told him, Jazakallah khair, Ya Maqdad. But he wanted to see what do the people, all three of those individuals were from Mecca, Muhajireen. Miqdad and those two other men are from Mecca. He wanted to see what do the people of Medina, the Ansar, what do they feel? Because this is after all their city. In the bay'ah, the allegiance when they gave to the Prophet وسلم, inviting him to Medina, they said, when you arrive in our city, then we will protect you. Before that, we can't protect you, Ya Rasulullah. So he wanted to see, because the battle is going to be taking place outside of Medina, does he have the support of the Muhajireen or uh, the Ansar or not? Then Sa'ad ibn Ma'ad, who was one of the leaders, he said, Ya Rasulallah, 
we will support you, we will fight with you, Ya Rasulullah. So the Prophet then realized that he does have the support of the companions, the Muhajirin and the Ansar, and he said, let us then go and get ready. He came out with 313 men. There was only one man who had a horse, al maqdad And they had few swords, very ill-equipped compared to the Mushrikeen, 1,000. Some of those Mushrikeen, they sent their slaves, their servants to get some water because Badr were actually wells. There are wells. They were named after a man from Juhayna by the name of Badr. So he dug the well and the, the wells were named after him, the wells of Badr. Those servants of Quraysh, they came to get some water, to fetch some water. The Muslims captured them. They brought them to Rasulullah. Rasulullah said, how many of the mushrikeen there are? They said, we don't know, Ya Rasulullah. He said, okay, how much do they eat every day? How many camels do they sacrifice every day so that they eat? The servant said, 10 per day. So the Prophet turned to his companions and said, so there is about a thousand of them. Because every one camel feeds about a hundred people. Look at the genius of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he told his men, we have to be prepared. Then the Muslims, when they hear the thousand and there were only 313, some of them started trembling, shaking. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prayed. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayed to Allah. He said, Ya Allah, we are your submitters. We believe in you. And if the mushrikeen win against us, they have the victory, then Islam will be eradicated. Then there will be no one to worship you on this earth, Ya Rasulullah. That's it. So he prayed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent angels, 3,000 angels, and then he sent 2,000 more, so 5,000 in total, to strengthen the Muslims, support them, and put fear in the hearts of the mushrikeen. Jibra'il came to the Prophet. He said, Ya Rasulullah, take some sand and throw it in the wind. So the Prophet did. Every one of the mushrikeen got a grain of sand in his eyes, which further increased their fear. Then, Al-Walid ibn Utbah, and Utbah and Shayba, all three of them came, and they said, we want to fight. They're from the mushrikeen side. So who do you choose to fight against us? The Prophet chose Ubaidah ibn Al-Harith, ibn Abd al-Muttalib. He chose Hamza, and he chose Amir al-Mu'mini Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ubaidah came, he killed his enemy, but he also was killed. That was the first martyr from the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He killed and he was killed. Hamza killed his enemy, but in the, before killing him, he was having a battle with him, a severe battle. They were exchanging swords back and forth. Amir al-Mu'mineen with one strike killed his enemy. Then he came, he saw his uncle Hamza is struggling with his enemy. So he told him, uncle, lower your head. So Hamza lowered his head, and Imam Ali with one strike also finished the second man. In that battle, then the battle engaged. The people started fighting, and Amir al-Mu'mineen, salamullahi alayh, killed 35 of the mushrikeen. In total, 70 of the mushrikeen were killed, including Abu Jahl, who was killed by Abdullah bin Mas'ud. He killed him. When he was killed, Abu Jahl said, Billati wal Uzza, I swear by the gods, Lat and Uzza. The Prophet said, This man is worse than Pharaoh. At least when Pharaoh was dying, he swore by the God of Musa. He believed. Abu Jahl believed in his gods until the last moment. 70 of the Mushrikeen got killed and 70 became prisoners. Then the Mushrikeen ran away. Among the people who got killed was the son of Abu Sufyan, Hanzalah, the brother of Muawiyah. The father of Hind, Utbah, and the son of Utbah, the brother of Hind, the three of them, all were killed by Amir al Mu'mineen, salamullahi alayhi. And the Muslims scored victory on the 17th day of Ramadan in the Battle of Badr. Despite their hunger, despite their thirst, they won the battle because of their Iman. Amir al Mu'mineen, salamullahi alayhi, tells Muawiyah in one of his letters, Ya Muawiyah, the same sword in which I killed your uncle, your brother, and your grandfather is still in my hand. That same sword is still in my hand. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among the Shia of Amir al Mu'mineen, salamullahi alayhi, and to increase in our understanding of the Holy Quran. 
We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to alleviate all the difficulties from all Muslims. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put patience and iman in our hearts, just like those who fought in the battle of Badr to support Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among the supporters of Imam al-Mahdi, ajjalallah ta'ala farajahu al-sharif, to hasten his reappearance, to fulfill all the hajat of the mu'mineen and the mu'minat. Allahumma kun li waliyika al-hujjat ibn al-Hasan, salawatuka alayhi wa ala abaih, fi hadih al-sa'ati wa fi kulli sa'ah, waliyan wa hafidan wa qaidan wa nasira, wa dalilan wa ayna, hatta tuskinahu ardaka taw'a, وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا رحم الراحمين اللهم ارزقنا شفاعة الزهراء يا الله يا الله يا الله لقضاء الحوائج ولشفاء المرضى ولكشف هذه الغم عن هذه الأمة وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات لا سيما أرواح موات الجالسين والحاضرين رحم الله من يقرأ السورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات اللهم صل Brothers and sisters, it's now namaz time, so we will prepare for namaz and uh, go from there.